Welcome to Late Nights at Lightbulb. Uh, Lightbulb Grip and Electric is a rental house in Brooklyn, and we do monthly free filmmaker classes uh, to help educate you guys and to help bring in industry professionals um, to share knowledge between filmmakers. We don't look at this as um, uh, masters teaching um, apprentices. We look at this as um, experienced professionals teaching each other about skills we may be um, is the skills that we're experienced in that other people may not share as much. So I figured a great topic that I can share that I've wanted to talk about for a while now is um, talking about leadership in film. And I feel like a lot of people in our industry get promoted based on the, their artistic abilities and their abilities to sell a client on a topic, but not necessarily on their ability to lead a team. And so I feel like this is a important topic that everybody should take a moment to focus on because not only does it make your days easier on set, it makes it easier um, for you to get hired by the pe from the people above you, and it makes the people that are working below you want to work so much harder. All right? So uh, today we're going to cover a bunch of topics. All right, so the first group of topics um, is going to be talking about getting ourselves into a mindset of thinking about how leadership works and how we build a team and how we're part of a team and between the, the management above us and there's us and there's the team below us. How does that relationship work and how should it scale? All right, and then we go into a whole bunch of um, topics that are, we're gonna get into some specifics of things that I wanna talk about in film. These are topics that are um, a little bit more pointed and direct. So the first group of topics is going to be a little bit uh, the larger ideas and then we'll get into some some specific points. Um, and then towards the end we're going to talk about um, uh, timing feedback and self-reflection and so this will be after the shoot is over. So this is these are all things that are going to happen during the shoot and um, things that you want to be present with moment to moment as the shoot's happening and then um, coming towards there, we have some, some prep conversation and some uh, after wrap conversation. All right, everybody with me so far? Yeah? yeah? Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna ask you guys to ask questions as we go. There is a lot of content that I'm going to try to cover and a lot of slides. I'm gonna encourage you guys to take notes as we go. So this um, content will be available up on Lightbulb Grip's website as well. Uh, we're gonna try to get that up in the next 48 hours or so. Um, so yeah, so stop me as we, as we go through things. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going and we may not get a chance to do it. At the end of the class, we'll have another Q&A where um, I'll have a, 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 the wider discussion with you guys. All right. So first of all, uh, let me tell you about the references of some of where I found this content and where I've grown from. And so part of me becoming experienced in this topic is through a group, a great group of leaders that I've looked at. Um, Simon Sinek is one that's going to, um, we're going to talk about the, in the first couple slides, the larger picture about how leadership w should work and how to build um, relationships among a team. And then uh, listen, learn, then lead, and how to start a movement. Our interesting conversations, these are all, um, they're all videos, and all of these you can find on YouTube. So these two are about um, more specific points in growing, this is in, in growing uh, patience and listening skills, um, how to start a movement, is looking at how people, uh, how social groups tend to form, and then uh, how great leaders serve others is, was also a very uh, important speech that led to me building a couple frames in here as well. So it's thinking about not uh, leadership not as pulling from the front, but leadership as pushing from behind. That your job as a leader is to serve and empower others to be able to get them to perform. Role of the team leader. Okay, so we're going to look at this as two, two phases, the outward pressures and the inward pressures. Um, stick with me so that we're going to talk very um, big picture at the moment, and then we're going to come back into details in a bit. So in the big picture, if we think about a team as a group of people, let's say we're, we're uh, trying to survive in the wild. You've got um, a group of villagers and they're trying to survive. There's uh, pressures that are coming in from outside the village. We've got uh, one of Simon Sinek's uh, examples that I love was um, the, you've got pressures from tigers, you've got um, other villagers, there are just dangers outside. And you're part of 
um, what happens inside a team is everybody, if everybody sticks together, we can get a lot more done, but then if we're not working together as a team and everybody has to focus on their own individual survival, and everybody has to worry about tigers individually, and everybody has to worry about um, invading villages individually, we don't have as much time in the day to get the things that, uh, to, to, to grow the team and get um, things done beyond our own survival. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? All right. I'm just going to ask because I can't see shaking heads so much because the, the light's facing me. Just put, um, put hands up if you, yeah, so the, that, that'll be a, a good agreement. Okay. Um, so now where does the, um, where does the team leader find themselves? And so often the team leader finds themselves on the barrier between the group and danger. So in, in the, the, the prehistoric example, um, the, the, that would be the alpha of the group. They're the ones whose job it is to go out first and to face danger first. And so by them taking on the brunt of what's coming in from the outside, everybody inside the group has more time to focus on building the village, maintaining, finding food, all the other necessary tasks without the outside stresses. With me? Yep, okay, great. So then let's look at for a second the inward pressures. So now we're picturing the village from the outside. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna use a different kind of example. How many of you guys have ever gone to a restaurant and ordered food and never met the chef? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, I see a lot of hands. We all go to restaurants and we'll blindly trust the fact that the people behind a closed door that we've never met are doing the right thing. And there's only one person between them and us. There's the waiter. And their job is to assure us that they're serving amazing food, it's well prepared, um, they give us a great experience. But that person is the same uh, blue dot from the other one, but now we're facing it from the other side. So their job, in this case, is to face this, now, now let's, let's look up towards management, let's look up towards leadership, wherever you happen to be, who, the people above you, and they're now responsible for the restaurant behind them. And their goal is to keep you from wondering what's happening in the kitchen. Because I guarantee if you guys hear pans start crashing and somebody start cursing behind the door, your first thought is going to be start wondering what's going on in that kitchen. You guys kind of seeing how this applies? Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit more specifically. All right. So, the role of team leader, um, leadership's not about an artistic experience, it's about creating a safe working environment for the people that you're in charge of. This gives them the time to do the craft that they're there to do and not worry about um, the, the pressures from the outside. All right, in return, they're able to complete better work for you without the social distractions and fears. Your reward is better pay and oversight as you move up. And that's um, the, the better pay is something that is granted to you in a leadership position because it makes sense that as the alpha of the group, as the leader of the group, um, you get the first pick. But then there are also responsibilities we'll get into later that come attached to that. All right, their reward is being able to find safety in the group and trust. And so this is what we were talking about before, about having time to do other tasks and not have to worry about danger. All right. Um, uh, I think we, we went through this. Um, but a really important thing to remember about leadership is that this is a primal relationship between the people that are in charge and the people that are, uh, respond, uh, that are, that are reliant on them that we can't ever break. And so this is why uh, Simon Sinek gets much better into this, um, into stories of how why graft and corruption stories hit us so hard, abusive power stories hit us so hard, because we all see this relationship being broken. Even though we're not um, immediately in that relationship, we're not immediately losing from that relationship, uh, we still see the same relationship happening elsewhere, and we judge it in the same way. Everybody with me? Okay. Ready to move on? All right. So uh, what we were talking about before, about um, the, if we think of that, that uh, character in the blue dot, are, are both our leader and our waiter. All right, so you're in the middle. And so now let's apply this to you. So your job is to be on that border wall. 
and live on and, and then communicate with both sides of it. So there are bosses above you, there are a crew below you, and then a primary thing is don't ever let one of them know about the problems the other one is having. Let me give you examples on that. Okay, so if you're in the middle and production is melting down, um, we're losing our actors, we're running out of sun, producer and director start screaming at each other, um, DP gets involved, and let's say you're gaffing this. I tend to do a lot of um, gaffing and DP roles, so that's gonna be a lot of my examples. All right, so my job is when all the guys below me are asking, well, what's going on? Don't worry, everything's fine. Because the stress that's happening above us can never benefit the people below me. In reverse, if I'm having problems in the kitchen, I never want my boss to find out that pans are falling down and people are cursing at each other. When I look up to my boss, I tell them, everything's fine, it's managed. Because stress crossing the line, the barrier um, that you represent, never benefits either side. So there's a great uh, gaffer that I learned this from, a, um, a 52 guy who's been doing this for a long time and works on big shoots named Carl Tebenhoff. And so at one point I remember asking him, how do you keep so cool on set when you have a crew of um, 20 guys, we're working over multiple city blocks, we've got three different camera units all happening at once, how do you keep that cool? And he said, it's this, don't ever let the, um, either side know about the problems that are happening. All right, so you're acting as an active positive filter of information between the, the two sides. And the important part is to filter out the negative, but keep the positive going. Director's happy with what's going on. We're, we're, um, we're ahead of our day. Um, the, my guys are humming along great. We're, we're already all set up on that other building. Uh, we're ready to go whenever you are. Keep the positivity flowing between both sides, but then stop the negative uh, as a barrier between. All right, uh, some more specific skills, uh, moderating your tone of voice, pacing and intonation between the two groups. The way you present the two groups is different. Uh, so we'll get a little bit more into that on how you work downward with a team. Um, working upward, I think most people know. Uh, all right, so openness. This is now we're gonna get into even more specifics. Then you doing okay? Yeah? Okay, great. All right. Um, so we're going to go through uh, this. Is, the next group of, of slides is going to be some specific pieces I find myself working on on set. So we're getting away from the bigger picture stuff, and now we're getting into the nitty gritty. All right. Uh, openness is I hear you and. That's a great motto to keep in mind. I hear you and. And so. It focuses you on making sure that you're not only present in the moment, that you're open to new ideas, and that you're responding to the idea that they're offering and not the one that you're thinking, that you've already jumped ahead and thought they were going to say. All right, so uh, a really important point when you're talking to people that are reporting to you is to give them a voice and then the voice creates pride on their part. Pride then leads to ownership of the completion. All right, so people that um, come up with an idea are really proud to be able to complete the idea. They're not only are they happy that they've been heard and, it makes, you feel, and it, it makes you feel good and part of the team to be contributing, but then it also makes you feel, you get a, um, a second reward when you find yourself able to complete that task as well. All right, so very often this whole section gets shut down by not being even willing to hear a new idea. All right, value and contributions in dialogue, even if you don't end up using them. So this is, I hear you and. This is a really important thing that I had to learn, and I'm still working on, is when somebody's contributing an idea, hearing the whole idea, letting them know that you've heard them. There are different ways to say this than just that group of words. Letting them know that you've, you've heard and, and um, uh, digested their idea, and that you've decided how to move forward. That's great, and let's do this. Now, here's the thing. This may be something completely different. Or let's steer this idea towards this way. And now you're continuing to bring them with them. Or you're continuing to bring them with you. But if you start with, nah, that won't work. But what we should do is this. Basically, what you've told them is, 
I don't need your ideas. I'm the one running the show. And then immediately they stop contributing because their job is to just listen instead of contributing and listening. If your team is contributing, you're getting more out of it. You're getting more out of them. All right. Uh, give, up, give, give them the credit up the food chain when talking to your boss. Accountability fosters respect and encourages them to continue contributing. So in the same way, uh, we were talking about making sure that they know that they have been heard and that they, um, they're contributing to the team, you're also making sure to pass that contribution upwards. Very often I see people that will say, no, 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 I don't like that idea, and then turn around to their boss and pitch the same idea. And you better believe that's a really horrible feeling for the person who just watched that whole thing happen, and their job is to shut up and smile about it because they can't tell you you're wrong, you're the boss. Everybody still with me? Any questions? All right, great. Okay, uh, another uh, point that I love to focus on is encouraging team members to share with each other and not just with you. So in terms of team building, if your job is to be on the barrier and your job is to be uh, working with the, the team, above, uh, the, with the, the leadership above you, and managing a lot of that inward and outward pressure, the more that you can get your team to work together on finding food, building houses, all the basic stuff, and managing their own world well, that intercommunication inter, uh, is really key to doing that. If everything has to flow through you, nothing gets done unless you say it. And then everything bottlenecks at you, and you've now quadrupled the amount of stress that you have to deal with because you're now dealing with every single decision. Nobody wants to make a decision on their own because they don't want to be told they're wrong. OK. Uh, all right, don't put a crew member in a position to fall on their sword. Give them credit for the good things, and you take the heat for the bad things. And part of that relationship is, if we go back to that circle again, that the idea is that um, they're getting credit for the houses that they build inside, but when a tiger comes in from outside and says something is wrong, your job is to face that tiger for them so that they can keep building houses. And that's part of that relationship. So you're both getting them credit for the good things, but then you take the heat for the bad things. Now this is something that I see, uh, that I don't see enough. I see a lot of young gaffers who will turn around the second, they, if they get a complaint, they'll turn around and bark at their crew member. And it's a literal, like, in one ear and right out the other within five minutes. And there's a phrase for that, of kicking the dog. And the idea being that a do um, you guys, do you guys all know this phrase? Have you guys heard this before? I can't tell what any of you guys are doing. Yes, no, yes, no, okay. All right, kicking the dog, the idea of kicking the dog is that, um, a, a dog plays a subordinate role to a human most of the time. And so um, when your day is not going well, you come home at the end of the day, and we're using the example to kick a dog, but they don't get a say in it. They can't go somewhere else. They can't leave the situation. They can't complain about it. They're stuck smiling and dealing with it. And it fosters a lot of negativity. It fosters a lot of resentment and fosters a lot of frustration because they had no say in what happened that caused them to get kicked. So in the same way here, when you put the, um, wait, no, uh, sorry, when you give them the blame for something that goes wrong, they're forced to eat it. The crew member is forced to eat it. And they can't com complain back up to you, but you better believe that builds resentment between you, that separates you guys, and then now that crew member feels like the leader is not protecting them against the wolves and the tigers and the bears. And now that crew member is his own little village and he's got to provide, he's got to maintain his own safety. And now there's walls up between him and you and probably walls up between him and the rest of the crew because now he doesn't know who he can trust. You see how this becomes this negative spiral that keeps going down, All right? So, um, Next, uh, allowing crew to have a conversation without you. I kind of got into this a little bit before. Um, worrying what happens when you're not th there also, though this was a topic I didn't talk about before, 
um, worrying what happens when you're not there boils down to insecurity. And I see this also happen from time to time. Uh, uh, so a way to fix that is making an active effort to, um, to not break up conversations, not interrupt, and also not demanding a catch up. Hey, what's going on over here? What are you guys doing? I thought you guys are supposed to be working right now. That stuff says, put your head back down, don't talk to each other, don't work together, just do. I'm the boss, everything goes through me. And, and now we're back to making your, life, making your life a lot harder. It makes it easier when your crew members are working together without you having to be present. All right. Uh, sharing only positive feedback on set. Uh, the constructive criticism, constructive criticism can wait until you're in private. I'm going to get to a whole slide on feedback later on how to give and receive feedback. OK, before I move on, everybody good? Yep, great. All right, finding patience, tick tock, tick tock. One of the things I struggled with a lot and I have had to work on over the last probably eight, ten years of work is trying to figure out how to manage time and my expectation of how my crew should move. So um, separate your stress from the task. Your stress is things like, are you hungry? Are you tired? Um, are you stressed out about a person versus the task that's at hand? And very often I find myself when I'm stressed out about something else, I turn around and, or I used to when I was younger, turn around and, and yell at the crew member, why didn't this happen already? I thought I told you this five minutes ago. And that, by definition, was kicking the dog. It took me a while to realize that. That me taking the stress from something somewhere else and then applying it to the crew I have is a misapplication of the problem. The crew member hasn't done anything wrong. The crew member has, is, is, took my group of orders, went down to the truck, got stuff, is on his way back up, and I'm yelling at him on the walkie, why haven't you done four flights of stairs yet, in essence? All right. Uh, ask yourself, oh, so this gets into a little bit more specifics. Ask yourself objectively how long something should take, and then avoid scolding for, um, uh, encourage quickness, but don't scold for slowness. So asking yourself how long something should take sets an expectation and helps um, me and others I've worked with manage the expectation for when something should, should be completed. So an open-ended goal uh, is really hard to figure out when it's been completed, but if you have a sense of in five minutes we'll have it back upstairs and then it's probably going to be, I don't know, ten minutes to set up this frame and then we'll be ready to go. Now you have a sense of where you are in the process and it's a lot less stress. All right, ask for your time estimates up front, or ask for whatever known information the team member has available for an estimate before sending them off. Do we have the thing we're looking for on the floor already, or do we, am I sending them off to go get something? Um, that helping set up expectations will help you manage your own stress a little bit better. And then allow your crew to do their work from start to finish. Uh, this is something that I see actually more experienced uh, crew members do than young crew members. When you know how to do something better than your crew member, don't take it away from them. Because a really frustrating thing is for you to tell somebody, OK, I need you to, to um, go back to the same example. I need you to build an 8x frame in here with this rag on it, with these stands, go get it. Um, and then how long is it going to take? OK, 10 minutes. They come back upstairs, and then you start taking stuff away from them and working on it yourself. They don't get that sense of completion. They don't get that sense of contributing to the team. They basically just turn them into a courier service. All right, so um, taking tasks away immediately says failure to the crew member as well. It's not something that we actively think about, but it's something that happens in our subconscious. OK, we're doing good? Yep, great. All right, allocation, square pegs and square holes. I know, doesn't that phrase sound funny? It's supposed to be square pegs, round holes, but square pegs and square holes. So figuring out how to use your crew, your crew well. So take the time to sort out your crew member's strengths. And sometimes this is you're figuring it out on the fly on set when you've been assigned a crew. Um, and you've just got to meet at the, in, in the morning, shake everybody's hands, and then try to get a sense of them quickly. But often when you can beforehand, I'll make phone calls to the crew. I'll have a conversation with them about how the day is going to go, what I'm looking to do, and then get a sense from them of where their hesitation points are. And I'm listening for the things that they tell me, yeah, 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 I got that part. 
Okay, there's the skill. And then, whoa, well, wait, what's, uh, what's going on here? So sometimes that's um, things like, sometimes it's literal skills about filmmaking, and other times it's conversational and um, uh, personality skills as well. All right, on set, pair skilled and unscrewed skilled crew member um, together to teach skills. So if you get, let's say, every once in a while working on indie films, the producer says, I don't have enough money to give you uh, an additional grip, but I can get a PA to come help for free. How much experience do you want to bet that kid has? But if I know I'm going, um, that we're doing a shoot that's going to use the same light over and over for the next, I don't know, um, 15 days, if I pair one of my experienced guys, maybe my best boy electric, with this young guy, and I put them together, he, the best boy, separate from me, will teach him how to use that lamp, how to set it up, and everything else. Now that team member has that skill. And then the next time I need it, I have two people that have that skill. And then we, we, bring in a, we promote another PA. Great, now I have three people that know that skill. But if I just sent the experienced team member to do it once and said, oh, I'll teach you some other time. I don't have the time to teach right now. Now you still only have one, and one, that's, one that doesn't know. And so that one that doesn't know will perpetually be stuck in a position of either being a, um, a courier for gear or a, a courier for crafty. Those are the only two things that they can do if they don't have skills. So start figuring out how to give your team skills, and that often can be done by pairing them up. And so you don't have to spend the time to do that, and you can turn around and face the management, face your boss, face the, the other, another tiger you have to deal with. All right. Hiring, thinking um, back before a job as you start putting a crew together, aim for harmony in both personality and skills. And that can be an easy thing to do, that can be a hard thing to do, but if you start thinking about it before the job, I'm willing to bet a lot of you guys kind of do this now, but you haven't really put a name on it. But if you spend the time to actually dedicate to thinking about how do these team members play well together? Do I have, if, is my experienced guy willing to teach if I've got a young guy? Or do I have an experienced guy who's going to be like, nah, I don't really work like that. That might not be a great pairing. And sometimes I've gotten rudely surprised on set when I realize, oh, I brought the wrong person in. And they're, they're skilled on their own, and the PA is trying, the, the, the um, grip turn is trying really hard. Neither one of them is really doing anything wrong. They're just not a mesh for each other. And so starting to take notes on those things and keep that present in your head as you go will help make you, uh, you able to hire better teams. Better teams make you look better. They work faster. And, and so the whole process gets better for you as well. All right, outside work. Um, so this is um, between jobs when you have downtime. Ask your crew members who they enjoy working with uh, and listen carefully to why. And you're both listening. One is for the review of another person that you haven't worked with before. Another one is for how they're reviewing. And so if you're trying to get into the head of the person that you're talking to, the crew member that you're talking to, and figure out what do they pride themselves on, what, do they, how, what levels do they communicate on, um, then unspoken statements and intonation tell you a lot about them as well as, as the person they're recommending. Any questions? You're shaking your head. No? Does that mean no questions or you're not confused? Okay, okay, great, all right. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so what do they value in others and what do they dislike about others? Now, what do they dislike about others will also tell you a lot about what they, um, how they think about the world and do their values match your values? Or is it things that, they're, that they may complain about somebody else something that you would agree with? Um, and so sometimes I found myself realizing more about the person that I'm talking to than, a person, than about the person that they're reviewing. OK. Clarity. This is one of those things that's really easy to talk about and then takes a long time to master. It's like solitaire. All right. Less words, clearer. And for some people, it's more words, clearer. Uh, so important part is figuring out <laughs> Oh, I love it. Sam at the AV desk, is, you're taking notes too? Yeah, all right, great. Um, so uh, an important point is figuring out for you whether you're a, an under-communicator or an over-communicator. 
how often do you find yourself stopping in the middle of a sentence or, or just maybe realizing in your own head of like, they probably know this already. You're an over-communicator. If you get asked what a lot, wait, what did you mean? Can you explain more? And you get that repeatedly from people at varying experience levels, you're probably an under-communicator. Again, one of those things that sounds really simple and makes, makes sense when I say it out loud, but a lot of people, I'm guessing, probably haven't thought about that before. All right. Uh, so, oh, I, went, I jumped ahead of what? Okay. So focus on giving directions clearly over a walkie with a person, a task, a confirmation, and a follow-up request. I'm going to go through each of these individually. Okay. So in order to communicate in pieces, or in order to communicate a whole idea, you need to work in a couple pieces, and it's a repeating pattern that happens the same way every time. So the first thing you're doing is clearly cueing a person. Avoid vague pronouns. I need a guy to get me. Now your whole team is scrambling because nobody knows who it is. Hey, Sam, can you bring me an XLR cable? Now a specific person knows, and everybody else can stay doing what they're doing. I've been on huge TV shows where the gaffer just says, I need an M18, and then the walkie goes quiet. And now we've got gear staged um, in front of the building. We've got gear on a truck. We've got uh, gear up in, in the, the apartment that they're shooting in. Nobody knows exactly where the M18s are, but all I know is I'm on the truck and there's an M18 next to me. I guess I better grab this one and go in case there's not another one. You have all this mass, mass confusion and wasted energy. It's all wasted energy. So if you're clear up front about who the person is, it saves you a ton of time. Task. Be clear about what you need completed, but don't micromanage the process. Give them the end goal, and then let them figure out the pieces. If they don't know the pieces, then you're going to give the, the, the cue is to give them a confirmation. You're good on that? OK, come back to me when you're done. If they say no here, that's your time to give them more details. Because now you're not micromanaging them if they actually need those details. But if you start with a five minute long task of every single um, uh, stand and clamp and, and specific piece that they need, you better believe everybody on the radio has tuned out and nobody is going to take those calls as seriously. All right. So being clear and quick about the task and then you give more detail when they need more detail. And then the follow-up is ask them to come back and inform you when the stage of the process is complete. So if you're going to start using your crew members to complete tasks, if you don't know that they're finished with a task, very often what I'll find is that somebody will finish a task and then they'll go back to staging. And they'll stand by a cart. Oh, no, I mean, frame's done. They didn't tell me that. So I have to look around and guess at what's finished or not. But when they finish um, putting up that frame, they come, talk to, uh, they, they come right over to me and tell me, I did it. And I give them a praise, thank you, great job, it's the way I need it. Or I give them a correction of, hey, let's try this instead. You give them the praise, they, that's, they, they, they finish a task, they, um, they, they get a piece of candy. They finish a task, they get a piece of candy. Humans are programmed that way. It works from, uh, from school all the way through adulthood. Um, it's the, the what was it? Uh, there's the carrot and the stick method. Carrot method works so much better. So in its essence, that's what you're doing, but then we catch it a little nicer. Two questions. OK. Is it better, because um, I find myself in situations where if I'm asking for a setup, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for it. Like I'll say, can I have this? Yeah. Instead of, it, some people are like, why don't you just tell me to do it? But that kind of, I feel like it sounds a little negative when you say, set this up. The setup up. You say, you know? OK, so the, the question is asking versus telling. So when you ask somebody to set something up, um, if they're willing to, are you saying, are you're, you asking? You're, you're just talking about the setup. Like. Okay, so you're having a conversation about the setup versus telling them, this is what I need done. Right. Okay, so that, when we came back, when we started looking at before about um, communication styles, about how different people like directions, your crew member has very clearly told you, in his case, or I'm sorry to, to uh, specify a gender, but um, in their case, that's how they communicate. They want to be told instructions. Other people may be, let's say you hire somebody who's a lot more experienced than you. You may come to them and ask them for advice. Hey, I'm looking to soften this light up. What do you think we should do? Because now that gives them a chance to have an input in the process and feel like their aged wisdom is respected. So in different fronts, it's, there's no one universal 
right answer to that question. But you've learned something specific about how that person communicates. I'm a person who likes a checklist and to be told this, this, and this, and I'll do those three things and then come back to you for my piece of candy. OK. Um, OK. <laughs> um, this, so this is exactly where we're heading with this. All right. Uh, some people prefer to be told the end goal and nothing else. Your more experienced players are going to want that. Hey, I need, I need something softer over here. And then other people prefer to be told in stages. All right. So evaluate your crew's working style and experience level. Um, those influence the amount of data that you should provide. I think we're kind of we're kind of covering the same thing again. Uh, okay. Don't let urgency overpower clarity and precision. So if we think back to being a barrier about stress, your your boss above you is putting pressure on you for urgency. Hey, we're losing light. Hey, we need to go. Hey, I lose the child actor in 20 minutes. But if you turn around and you and and hold on to that that sense of rush and that sense of urgency. Um, to the crew member below you, you're going to lose clarity and precision. They're not getting the right amount of information. They're getting rushed, and they're told they're being told that faster is better than right or than done right. Um, so keeping the discussion calm and paced allows you to maintain clarity, keep that barrier working, and then keep your team feeling safe and like they're just a train that's chugging along. OK. Uh, do you share too much or do you share too little? Ask others for a review. Um, some people I feel in film have trouble asking for advice because they feel like it appears to be insecurity if you ask somebody, how am I doing? But at the same time, when you're working at peers with you on your level or peers that are above you, that might be a great time to be able to ask that question relatively safely and get an honest answer from somebody who's been in the industry as long as you or longer than you. This is not something to ask your boss. Let me clarify on that. But this is something to ask somebody that you're working next to or that um, that's, uh, has, has years on you. If you're asking your boss that, that definitely does sound like insecurity. OK. Releasing. Talking about stress. No bugs up butts. This is a phrase that I picked up from a gaffer in the middle of the desert outside Las Vegas on this Wild West kind of shoot that was uh, crazy and hot and sweaty and a lot of pain for 15 days. All right. Uh, to work on de-stressing, because I find as stress builds up during the day, it can get to a critical level for a lot of people. And that leads to um, either blow-ups, walk-aways, or a lot of chain smoking. All right, reevaluate your shooting days on a moment by moment basis. It's easy to build up stress from small things throughout the day, a la getting a bug up your butt. So um, you're going to have little bits of uh, little pressures. Which way goes? Uh, yeah. All right, you have little pressures that build up from different sources. Your truck's late in the morning. And then um, your, your boss is really not thrilled with the scene we did yesterday, but we just got to keep going. So hope you don't screw it up today. And then your. Um, you have all these little things that stack up, and then that the, the, the different stresses can all build to one stress inside of you. And sometimes it's hard to define why am I so stressed out until you take the time to separate it into pieces and, and analyze it. So um, there is a phrase, what is it? Uh, halt. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you tired? Are you late? Are you late? Are you tired? Um, and it was a phrase that I learned at, uh, I learned from a friend at Burning Man. And sometimes when you're in really stressful environments, like in this case, Burning Man is a festival that happens out in the middle of the hot sun in, in, um, in Nevada. And when you're, when you're sitting under the beating sun, you, a lot of people can get bent out of shape over time and not realize what things are causing them to be stressed out. And so the idea of halt is it's something you say to yourself and it happens inside your own head and you go through a little checklist. Am I hungry? Am I, um, what's, oh, um, yeah, hungry, angry, 
uh, late or tired. And so these are things that often, in that situation, create stress and create um, and, and can, can chip away at your mood and being able to perform. And so in our world, we have a different group of uh, pressures facing us than, than being out in the desert. But at the same time, the same idea of, of having a moment where you halt and think about, in a checklist in your head, how did I get to this point? Why am I angry? Why am I frustrated? And then having that, that clinical analysis of where am I? All right, so constantly look for calm in your own head and praise it aloud when you see it in others. All right, so being calm is a great thing when it happens for you. And when you see it in your crew, that's your time to encourage good behavior. And your crew keeping calm, once they see one person keeping, or once you see one person keeping calm and you praise that, it leads to everybody else thinking about calmness, thinking about um, uh, working stress-free and thinking about uh, helping make an easier day. And so in one action, by praising one person, everybody else hears it. All right, also, uh, don't hold grudges. And then ask yourself, why am I mad right now? And so this is the whole discussion I just had a second ago. Um, and answer it honestly. If it's a grudge, drop it immediately. Film has no time for egos. Sets have no time for egos. We're all technicians or creatives in different ways, but ego is not something that will ever gain you anything. So a grudge, in when you distill it down, is the, is the feeling that somebody has offended your ego, your sense of who you are. And so grudges end up creating resentment, resentment creates stress, and that creates a rift between you. And now, once you're, you're in a grudge, and once you're in, in that resentment world, that ring of safety of the group has vanished, and now it's just about me. Remember where we were before. Um, and now I'm operating as my own person. I got to do my own safety. I got to you know, look out for, for number one over here versus helping contribute to the team. All right. Um, another great piece of advice that I learned from, uh, I'm trying to think who, um, Jamal Solomon, working with him years ago. I just worked with him again last week, and we were talking about this. Um, during quiet moments, ask your crew how they're doing. And I'm not asking them about the job. I'm asking them as people. How are you as a person right now? And it's a great moment to be able to connect with somebody, to be able to let them vent, sometimes about stress that maybe not, doesn't involve directly involve you, but it helps them release steam and come back to calm. And it helps you also make sure that you're maintaining and checking in with people, not just as technicians, but as humans as well. We've all got our own little worlds that we're all trying to manage. And sometimes being willing to put your hand down and say, hey, are you doing OK right now, really helps. Sometimes it's just shooting the breeze and we're hanging out between setups. But every once in a while, you'll find something's going on under the surface that you didn't know about that you can help make their day better. And now you're a great leader just by asking and just by willing, being willing to get involved. How are we doing so far? I haven't checked in in a little bit. Any questions? I can never tell when there's no questions, am I doing really well or not? OK, all right. Um, yay, OK, great. All right, equanimity. This is a word I love. And it took me until Zach Aron reminded me about this, that um, we, were, we had a conversation about like, leadership skills, because as, as I was putting this talk together, and I was, it's a word I've been looking for for a while and trying to, trying to place. And this comes back to that sense of calm. So equi equanimity is mental calmness, composure, and even temper, the state of neutral calm. Uh, so uh, equanimity leads to lighter days, less stress, better communication, and you appear more experienced by simply, uh, by simply presenting as if I've done this a million times before, and nothing stresses me out. Nothing surprises me, and nothing, and, and nothing concerns me. Well, there are things that will logically and, and uh, uh, clinically concern me about you know, um, uh, timing and you know, logistics kind of stuff, but then there aren't things that are getting me stressed out in a, in a concerned way. All right, so 
Equanimity is about building that little bit of zen around you, just one second. And then if you remember, go, going back yet again to being that barrier between two worlds, if you're that moment of zen between those two worlds, it makes life a lot easier. Mike, you were going to ask a question. Okay, so is it bad to be too calm? You find yourself being, uh, was, what was your example? You, if you, you're sitting, you find yourself on the set burning and everything's fine? Okay. Yeah, okay. So you find yourself standing there saying, eh, not a big deal. That's a relative, yeah, we'll get through it. It's a relatively good thing. Uh, there's a difference between being silent in moments of stress when you should be acting versus being able to manage the stress well. So still being an outward communicator and still proactively working with the, t the team above you and the team below you, but maintaining calm in the process. So I'm still saying a lot of words. I'm still having a lot of conversations and being part of what's going on. Uh, it doesn't, being calm and being silent are not the same thing. They're very, they're, they're very different things. Being, I can be calm and loud or stressed out and silent as separate items. W does that answer your question? OK, wonderful. All right. So I'll often find myself, when I'm getting stressed out, thinking about finding Zen. Find, and that's a very vague term. What does Zen mean to you? Find, figure out how to find calm. All right. Planning ahead, practice, practice, practice. Um, this is not necessarily, this is partially a leadership skill and partially a good filmmaking skill. And it's one I just love hammering home on every single um, class we do, but we're gonna go over it one more time. All right, prep time allows you to work out a plan before the shoot happens. And by allowing yourself to work out a, um, a plan before the shoot happens, you come in having most of your work done, uh, done ahead of time. The difference in stress level between showing up prepared and showing up unprepared. If you think back to like high school, show up to your test prepared or un unprepared. Every single shoot day is a test day. And if you've done all of your homework and you've done all the practice lessons and you you're show up prepared, even if the day changes, it's not a lot of stress because you've read all six chapters and this is somewhere in those six chapters. This, the, what ends up on the test is somewhere in those six chapters. Um, so we'll get through this. But if you haven't studied at all, Everything on the test is a surprise. There's a lot more emotion involved, there's a lot more stress, and it's a lot harder to communicate when you don't know what's going on around you. All right. Prep should take at least three times longer than the shoot period. And this is time that you're devoting to becoming a better professional and a more experienced filmmaker. And so you don't always get paid for this time. I know a number of uh, DPs that I've worked with who say, oh, I don't do unpaid prep days. I'm just not going to prep then. And they think that's a valid conversation to have with a producer to say, to pressure them into paying them for those prep days. But what you're saying to the producer is, I'm not willing to get involved in your project unless I'm getting paid, and I'm not willing to get in artistically involved in the project. Because that prep is partly also about you building yourself as an artist. You with me? Yeah? OK. All right. Uh, Oh, an example I love on this is plate juggle on ice skates. Um, it's, uh, you can learn how to juggle plates on ice if you've skated before. But if you haven't skated before, you don't have your fundamentals done on a shoot day, you can't juggle what's going on on set. So the idea being that um, if you're trying to, you can't figure out the, the fundamentals of what's happening on set and where we're going and what locations are changing and um, and which scenes are, are switching up. Uh, you can't handle those changes if you don't fundamentally know what's also happening on set and where your team is and how you guys are looking to perform, what your goals are. You haven't set any, you haven't set any expectations for yourself, and it just makes the whole process more frustrating. You'll never achieve a lot. You'll just, if at best, get lucky and be able to do them both at once for a period of time. All right. Being prepared will give you a to-do list and a scale of completion. So in, pre in prepping, you know the pieces that need to get done. You know um, 
how crazy your day is going to get. You know how many setups you're looking to do, which scenes are going to be tougher, which scenes you have more time to play. And all of these help contribute to you knowing more going in, which lowers stress levels. You lower your stress level, the crew has an easier time. You have a conversation with your crew beforehand about this stuff as well. You help lower their stress levels. Now, not only are you prepared, they're prepared, and we're all going into this with easier days. Oh, you remember on the phone call we had, I said we might do this? Yep, we're flipping to the other idea. Great. You've had that whole conversation with all three of your guys. They now know what they need to go get from the truck. You don't need to have the whole conversation again with them on set. All right. Um, also, completion gives you a, creates a feeling of success. So once you're, we're going back uh, again, um, re-cementing ideas that we've, uh, we've talked about before. As you're building up your, um, your to-do list, you're giving, yourselves things, you're giving yourself things to check off as completed versus uh, living your day not knowing what's coming scene to scene. If you're not prepared, you don't know what's coming, you don't know how far you are in the day, and you have no sense you're just a boat on the water, you don't know where you're going. Hiring above you. So, all right, so insecurity about your own position leads to hiring an underskilled crew more often than not. If you're not as confident about what you're doing, you think, well, I'm the only one that knows the plan. And so you, the, the people that you bring in, you're more likely to bring in people that are below you in experience level and are willing to do as they're told. Because you need more uh, worker bees than you need thinking bees. If, if you're coming in looking at it in reverse, you're going to get, I lost my train of thought, one second. Um, if you're coming in with security about where you are and where you're looking to grow and where you're looking to, uh, what you're looking to do on set, you're more likely to bring in experts in those fields. And you look at people that have more experience than you as resources. Because as the team leader, you don't need a lot of other people who are willing to do a little bit of everything. It's more often useful to have one person who's really good at building houses, one person who's really good at collecting food, and, um, and to diversify the people inside this little village that you're building. Going back to that first example. Um, okay, so, oh, um, I, didn't, I didn't explain this idea. Okay, hiring a, a hire Ron or hire Gandalf. So I'm using Ron, uh, any of you guys seen Harry Potter? Ron Weasley is the kid who's always trying to you know, figure out how magic works and he's never really getting it right, but um, somehow he's skating by in class versus hiring the Gandalf, the guy who's been doing this for, for a decade, or for uh, I don't know, 100 years or something. In, in, I don't know my Lord of the Rings, never mind. All right, um, you get where I'm going with that. All right, if you don't know how to do something, hire somebody who's a Gandalf at that topic. My first instinct and I'll, I'll, I'll say this as, as a, uh, a problem of mine, my first instinct is to jump onto Google and start trying to figure out how to do that thing. I've never shot green screen underwater before. I should go learn how to do it. And yes, that's a good skill. But the problem is I'll then consider that the knowledge that I've collected, my short education on this topic of probably a night of YouTube and, and, uh, and Googling and, and calling a couple people as, well, this is, must be all the information there is about it. And so I'll just have a guy do the thing I want them to do versus bringing in the person that you're going to call anyway to do that job. All right. All right. Once you get somebody who's experienced in the topic, do, let them do their job. And so when you're working with somebody who's more experienced than you, questioning them is infuriating. But also, you're keeping them from contributing their experience. So sometimes standing back and letting them do what they need to do will make it work better. All right. Trust in them allows them to work with more clarity and less distraction. You guys are taking notes, a chance to catch up with me. All right. Timing feedback. So we're about two thirds of the way through at this point. Uh, praise publicly, correct privately. This is a long time business practice that for whether you're, you're leading an army of um, stockbrokers in cubicles or you're leading a uh, ship full of people or a film crew. Praise publicly, correct privately. 
when you're praise is something that should be shared among the whole team because one person's success is all of our successes and praise as we talked about before praising one person's success encourages other people to do the same success again because they know they'll get a piece of candy for doing it but when you correct publicly it tells everybody that you're judging the group and that uh, you think it's important that everybody knows the group's failures. Now also, who's overhearing this? Are you, going, are you basically going into the kitchen and knocking the pans over yourself and screaming at the chef yourself? And everybody else above you may be hearing this. All right, two important ways to give feedback. Short-term feedback uh, gives the crew member a hit of pride. Great job, I love what you did over there. I'm so, or, um, I'm so glad when I sent you uh, off two blocks away to set this thing up and we came over here, everything's where it needs to be. I love that I could trust you to get this done. Great, those are good little short hits that tell people uh, that happen over the course of the day. These are your high fives. Start doing them more often because I'm willing to bet you're not doing them enough. These things are happening in your head. You're, you're proud of your crew members for, um, for getting things done on time efficiently the way you needed them done. We're keeping everything moving. But did you say it to them? Did you take the moment to have that, that quick back and forth conversation with them? Do it more than you're doing it right now. Because I can guarantee that more won't hurt. All right. Long-term feedback gives the crew member a sense of investment. So long-term feedback is thinking more than just the shoot day. Um, a common thing I'll see at the end of a shoot is we wrap out the last day, and then the next morning I wake up and I get an email in my inbox. It's CC old to the whole crew from the director that says, thanks guys, you did a great job. We got our days done, we didn't think we could make it happen, but you guys were killer and you made it happen. Great job, we'll see you on the next one. Send in your invoices. And everybody looks at that email and goes, cool, all right, what am I doing today? There's no investment in it. Because we all see email and it's this throwaway thing that CCing all to everybody is the least amount of investment that you can put into it. I didn't want to have to work harder. I didn't want to have to write 40 notes. I could just CC everybody, write one nice thing once, and not have to worry about it. That's not investment. Investment is taking the time to call your crew afterwards and say, one, how did it go for them? Two, I really like that we did this. And then sometimes you'll also have constructive criticism for feedback and growing. But now we're in a private time. Now we're working separate from what's happening on set, and that's the time to have that conversation when all the stress has faded away and we can just look back at the past clinically. So take the time to give long-term feedback. And it helps people grow, and it also helps um, in the long-term encourage people to, do, uh, to, to continue doing the things that you like them doing when they're working with you. Remember what I said before that um, before you guys came into the lecture that um, start taking notes now because 24 hours from now if you go through the notes again you'll uh, up your the amount of data that you recall twice as much if we apply that idea to this we finish a shoot day we've learned a lot over the course of the shoot day the next day we have a conversation hey I'm so glad that you were on top of your game the whole time. That crazy projector that was acting up, I love that I just looked over to you and I pointed to you and you said, I got it, I got it, I know what's going on. And that was a great thing. And in the moment we give them a little thumbs up, great, just call me, let me know when, you, when the, the projector's working again. But um, also, you're reminding them that I really enjoyed the fact that you were self-sufficient. I really enjoyed the fact that you were, um, that you didn't have to wait for me to tell you what to do, you just took care of it. That was a great thing. They're gonna remember that a lot more than just the thumbs up that happened on set. All right, praise is loud, let the team hear. We went over this before. Um, if they think, if um, everybody else's opinion of that one person raises, and so now we're in a group that's all supporting each other and we're all working on building scaffolding higher as a team. All right, uh, praise comes from the boss and the community. Um, so, oh sorry, pride, I said that wrong. Pride comes from the boss and the community. So when we look back at the candy example, if, so I'm both giving 
by me giving praise, they get some pride from me, but they also get pride when they look around and see everybody else has seen, uh, has seen them be uh, praised. This is just getting down to like the root of human behavior. Everybody with me so far? We're doing good? Okay. And we're on to our last slide. Now we come down to just working on you. All the phone calls are done. We had a lot of conversations. We've heard a lot from our crew and from our, our boss that we work with. Yeah, you can, call, call, um, you can call your boss and have a conversation about this as well. Sometimes it's just a friendly checkup chat and thanks for bringing me on the job. And then sometimes that leads into having a conversation about the job itself. Hey, what did you think about this? Hey, I'm just looking to learn um, why did, um, what made you do this setup this way? Because I thought that was a really interesting solution that I wouldn't have thought of. What led you to that? Having conversations up the food chain also helps cement those relationships. But once that is all finished and done with, then it's down to you. And you have to work on you. All right. So self-reflection, important to be firm, not mean. Um, and so solo postmortems are important because it's also your time to course correct. So uh, a model that works for a friend of mine is to teach somebody else about the shoot. He'll sit down and he'll have a conversation with his girlfriend about how the whole shoot day went. You'll have realizations as you go through the day. Um, and his, in his case, working against somebody else works, but in this, you could also be, in essence, uh, as a software ex uh, engineering example, is to uh, talk to, or was it, uh, teach a rubber ducky. So somebody had a rubber ducky on their desk and they'll go through a software problem and they'll explain the whole thing to the rubber duck and I'm willing to bet by the time you get through everything, you'll find your own error by explaining it to the, to the rubber duck. In the same way he uses his girlfriend to do it, um, by just having the conversation, you go through pieces, you realize a, another level separated from the problem, what was actually happening. That you might have been clouded and not seen at the moment because you're living in a world of stress, or you're living in a world of urgency, or you're living in, um, a, you're, you had a grudge at the time, and that clouds you from being able to see it. But once, it's separate, once you have that separation, it gets a lot easier, and it becomes a lot more apparent. You have idea, like a light bulb moments. Oh, hey, that was a, that was a, a brand plug. All right. Um, okay, so in the process, um, create a concrete list of growths and successes. And for me, sometimes that's writing it down on a sheet of paper. Sometimes it's just remembering what happened. And, and the, sometimes this, the conversations with the other crew members are enough because I cemented a lot of the growths and successes with them, so I've, I've been through it in my head. Um, also create a list of the problems you saw. And this is a list that happens in your own world that nobody else will ever see. This is problems that you felt you had outwards and problems that you saw from other people inwards. And we're not looking about blame. We're not looking at whose uh, who's fault. We're not looking at, um, uh, we're not looking at how it made you feel. We're looking at, in a clinical sense, what happened. And that way, you can see that train of thought that may have led them to that point, or you can see your train of thought that may have led you to a point that you didn't like, and then work backwards on how do you fix that problem. Because everybody has different problems with how they deal with either leadership or how they deal with their own presentation. And if you don't take the time to reflect on it and to do a postmortem and dig into uh, the, the problems, you're not going to learn from them. You're going to come back to set the next time, and you're going to see the same problem and say, ah, damn it, this thing again. But you don't have a solution for it. You just know it's the same problem again. All right, uh, analyze these problems. Clinical analysis, no emotion, no beating yourself up. Beating yourself up is applying blame. Blame gets you nothing in this discussion. All right, and creating adjustments for the future. In business, we call these uh, action plans or action tasks. Um, but in reality, for, for us as filmmakers, because we know we're never going into the same conference room twice, we're never, uh, nothing in our lives really repeats very much. Um, all, the best we can do is figure out how to just gently co course correct the ship to, ha to weather the next storm a little bit better. And then lots of little course corrections, and sooner or later we're on the right path. All right, any questions? All right, great. 
So this is a recap of the topics that we covered today. So we started with the large picture of uh, visualizing the barriers uh, that exist in leadership, how to separate and how to create openness across the barriers between you and your team and, your t um, and you and your leadership. And then we got into a whole bunch of specifics of the patients, allocation, clarity, releasing, equanimity, and some planning. Um, so planning and hiring above you are, are, are tasks that we're doing before a job, and then timing, feedback, and self-reflection are things we're doing during or after a job. And so overall, that I think is a large group of skills that will help you uh, both fare better for yourself on set, help create a better working environment for your team uh, beneath you, and help make your superiors feel more confident in how you're working on set and how they can trust in you. Wonderful. All right. So um, for the notes, uh, go visit lightbulbgrip.com. So we're recording this uh, presentation. We're going to put it up on the web. Uh, we share these through um, Craig Burns has a great group called Applebox Network that once every Friday they, uh, they'll show either a live interview with a filmmaker or educational lectures. And so we started contributing our content once a month. So we've had a, a discussion about diversity and we've had um, a discussion about a uh, panel about producing skills and um, dealing with clients' budgets and uh, uh, client relations. So this is going to be the, the third in our topic. And so uh, also for you guys who are in the audience, if you guys want to see the slides again, we're, we're just going to upload it as one PowerPoint file for you guys to view. Wonderful. So that's all I got for, for today. You guys got any questions for me?